behalf of the Badminton Pan American Confederation, we give you the warmest welcome to our Coach Corner program. My name is Richard Wong, and it is my pleasure to be the moderator, moderator of today's session. We have reached the end of the fourth season, and before introducing today's speaker, we will link up in Jamaica with Mr. Vishitolan, President of the Badminton Pan American Confederation. Hi, Gregory. Thank you. Dear friends, on behalf of Badminton Pan Am, let me thank you all for achieving one more season of our Coach Corner program. For one year, on May the 8th to be more exact, we launched this program with great expectation, but also with some fear. And look how far we have advanced. We never thought we would have gotten to four seasons. Hand in hand with great professionals, we have reached 61 episodes. Amazing, 61 episodes and more than 14,000 views on our YouTube channel. That's an excellent, excellent performance. And that's a record that we will celebrate with all of you. It is fitting to acknowledge our host, Adrian and Richard, our friends from Badminton France, Olivier and Amina, to our friends from Special Olympics and Badminton Europe. Likewise to our translators, Marion and Bruno, and to the entire production team led by Herman and Juan Pablo, and doubly thanks to our presenters, who with their interesting talks, we have been able to have a presence, not only in the Americas, but in more than 46 countries around the world. So truly we have become global in our presentation. Therefore, I officially announce the end of the season. And let us not dis disconnect as we will return on July the 3rd with more news. Thanks to all of you for being such great, great participants. Please, Gregory, let's continue with our special guest for today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tolan. Today, we had the pleasure once again of having one of the most emblematic coaches in the world of badminton, Raju Rai from the United States, who will talk to, about, talk to us about a topic of great interest, mindful methods to improve your performance in competition. Now, before we head over to Raju's presentation, I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speaker. As an athlete, Raj was a 2008 US Olympian for men's singles. His highest world ranking was 37 in the world in men's singles. And he is also a seven time US national champion. As a coach, he works with USA Badminton high performance as a level three coach. He's an assistant, he was an assistant coach for Team USA at the 2019 Pan American Games. And he is also the head coach for multiple training academies that have produced over 50 junior national champions. Good afternoon there in the US, Raj. Welcome to our program. Thank you for sharing with our audience and receiving us from your home in California. We kind of ask that you take control over the presentation and share your screen. Awesome. Thank you, Richard, President Tolan, Badminton Pan Am, and my sponsors Yonix and Spring Aqua for this opportunity to speak with you today. I'm excited to share with you guys these mindful methods that can help you overcome, you know, your nervousness and your pressure and competition. So glad to, to have you all join us today. <clears throat> My presentation will focus on three key areas today. We will focus on the pre-tournament and specifically on goal setting, mental pre preparation, certain healthy habits you can have uh, before you go into competition and how to simulate what the tournament will be like. The bulk of the presentation will go through here on um, in-tournament exercises, how to develop a proper warm-up routine for yourself, in-game practices and strategies that you can work on to improve your mental game in competition as well as what you can do in between matches on how you can recover. And lastly, we'll, we'll take those 
lessons learned and apply those into post-tournament, whether it's a reflection exercise, implementing some of the, the key weakness, weakness areas into your training plans, and how to have and establish certain checkpoints along the way so that before your next competition, you can improve as a badminton player. Starting first with our pre-tournament goal setting, it's, it's very important to establish your goals prior to the tournament. Usually I like to do these about two to four weeks out of a tournament. And the reason being is you wanna set expectations for yourself, or if you're a coach, you wanna set, help your player set those expectations for themselves. And the goals can range from anything small, like I wanna win my first match and make it out of the first round. It could be beating a seated player or it can go beyond that to winning a medal or becoming a champion in, in their, um, their category. But the downfall of not creating a goal before going into the tournament can lead to you know, an, an unsuccessful experience. One, you may not have the same motivation, purpose, or direction in your training. And second, um, speaking from experience from myself as an athlete or also coaching several <clears throat> players, there has been numerous times where a player may be in a key match and um, stepping into that match, they did not set a goal for them to win that match. And at that time, you know, they've won the first set, they're about to close out the match and they have this moment in the game where they realize, oh my gosh, I'm actually gonna win. And at that time, they tend to freeze. Um, they feel the pressure of the moment. They, uh, they get really nervous and, and nothing seems to work at that point. And a lot of times that's a reflection of not setting the correct goals before the tournament. So it's really important to um, you know, set those expectations for yourselves and communicate that between player and coach so that everyone is on the same page. And we'll walk through a little um, kind of goal setting exercise that um, I usually do with my athletes. <clears throat> what we'll do is we'll take a, a three minute session here where we can focus on a list here on the left of what they are good at. And the key here is to have the players on a three minute timer, just list a bunch of positive statements on what they feel they are good at. And for example, these are some of the um, positive statements that they should write. These should be specific statements. There should be no doubt in their points that they make, and these should come from the players themselves. So things like, I have a strong smash. My net spin is really good. I have a great serve. I have a strong backhand. These short um, statements here are just positive ways to get the player to realize what are the strong points in their game. A lot of times leading up to a tournament, we get a lot of anxiety or nervousness and um, because there is a lot of unknown, we're not sure how the tournament's gonna go. Maybe we're not sure who we're gonna play, what the environment, is the shuttle fast? Is there a draft in the um, badminton hall? There's a lot of variables that are out of our control and that creates a lot of nervousness. And this is kind of a way to um, distract the player and distract the mind to focus on, you know, certain things that we can control. So having this list for the players to really, you know, um, internally look within themselves and recognize what their strengths are is very, very valuable. And then we do another three minute session where they can list the feelings that they want to feel on the court. So you have them Think about you're in the tournament, you're on the court. What do you want to feel? I, you want them to say things like, I see myself having fun on the court. I see myself very focused. You know, they're, they're able to picture themselves playing without any nervousness or any distractions. I see myself believe, believing in my shot. That's like a scenario where, you know, the players are hitting every shot with confidence. They believe it's in. They, they're not afraid to make a mistake. <clears throat> so you we're able to um, have the player start visualizing what they're good at, how they want to feel. They're picturing that environment of the tournament rather than worrying about what if I lose or what if this doesn't go right. And as a coach and as a player, we all have those thoughts in our head. It's, it's probably impossible to get rid of them, but we can play these games with our mind 
and distract them by focusing more on the positives. So after the players have, have this list, I like to ask them to circle four to five statements that they wrote that brought them the most excitement or confidence. And um, when they choose those, those will be their five statements or what I like to call them, their five affirmations that they should try to use on a daily basis leading up to the tournament. So that's about two to four weeks outside of the tournament preparation. And they're already starting to uh, manifest how they want to play, how they want to feel during the tournament. And it's a very useful exercise to, you know, translate their thoughts from a negative perspective into more of a positive one. The second important thing is also, it's important to have healthy habits. Um, I'm guilty of it myself. I may not always eat healthy year round, but I think, you know, two to four weeks out leading up to the, to the tournament, you definitely want to clean, clean your diet up, make sure you have a balanced diet. If you change anything within that two week window, the danger there is you don't know how your body's going to respond. It could respond well, it could not. And then you don't want to go into a competition, not feeling strong and feeling healthy. Um, the second is also having adequate rest. You want to make sure you're, you're getting enough sleep. Also, the time that you sleep at, you want to follow that regimen that you're going to have in a tournament so your body can adjust. You can build this routine that you're comfortable with. And with, with you getting enough rest, you know, your, your, your mindset and your emotions will be a little more calm and it won't be so reactive to, you know, certain things that may go uh may not go your way <clears throat> healing injuries is another big thing you know you've been training hard to prepare for the tournament you know in that two to four week window that's not really the area that you want to continue to push yourself and improve here you're trying to heal your injuries you're trying to get one to 100 percent you want to build that excitement and that motivation to want to play in the tournament rather than you've been working so hard and you know you're kind of dreading the, the amount of work that's coming and, and you're feeling more of that pressure and that, that negativity versus, you know, you, you want that excitement to step onto the court. And then the last is just to reiterate the positive thinking. That's, that's got to be the key here. You know, you want a healthy, you know, mind, body and soul coming into that tournament. So that's where those affirmations and those reflection exercises can really, you know, keep your mind on the right path stepping into a tournament. So those are just some of the free uh, free kind of key tips that will, you know, help you lead up into the tournament and, you know, get you on the right track um, before the tournament begins. Um, <clears throat> and then in that window of preparing, you want to start working out some of the routines that you're going to have during the term tournament, having a, a special warm up routine that you like to go through certain stretches or on court exercises that you like to practice, I think that's really important as a player for you to develop. Everybody has their own kind of special way to warm up. And, you know, in that two to four week window, you can play around with different things in your warm up, and you can see how that affects your performance um, in a practice setting before you, you know, you go into the tournament and you go in a certain way and, you know, the result isn't what you expect. You won't have a second opportunity to do that again. Um, your in-game exercises, which, which we're going to talk about a lot lately, that's also an opportunity to practice, you know, in your practice sessions to see what works for you on court and what doesn't. And then in that, in that um, recovery time uh, leading up to the tournament, you want to see, you know, how much you need to cool down, what type of meals you need to eat post-match to um, get your energy back, and, and what kind of uh, physical therapy may needed to uh, maybe needed to heal um, whatever injuries you may have. So those are um, some key tips leading up into the tournament. Now in the tournament, I want to concentrate a little bit more on your warm up routine, definitely in game practices and how we can recover from match to match. <clears throat> so I touched on this a little a bit earlier, but creating a personalized routine for you to properly stretch and warm up your body is key. Some people like to do certain types of footworks. 
Some um, like to do a lot of um, dynamic warm-ups, um, a long stretching session, listening to music. You really have to figure that um, routine for yourself. And I, I use this word routine a lot. And the reason is um, when you have a routine, you feel comfortable. You feel that you are in a normal setting. It's not that you're stepping into a, one of the biggest tournaments of your career and you're going to feel that pressure. And these are just all ways that, you know, you can warm up your body, your body's used to it, it's comfortable, you know what to expect. And that will all kind of keep your emotions level rather than going too high or too low leading into a match. And make sure you have a set of basic hitting, hitting drills you like to do on court, whether it's um, just basic standing clears, drops and lifts, movement around in the half court setting, or you may even want to open it full court. It's just an, it's an opportunity for you to get used to the court, your footwork, the lighting, there may be a draft in the, in the badminton hall, the shuttles may be quick, the shuttles may be fast. So there's a lot of li little different things here that you have to get used to um, getting acclimated to your environment in a very quick setting. Usually, if you have a time to warm up before the match, it may be only um, five to 10 minutes and you want to be able to kind of get yourself comfortable in that environment. And I'll show you a few videos here shortly on a special hitting routine that I kind of created for my players. Um, and as you can see on the screen here, it's usually what I like to do is three to five minutes of recovery strokes. And these are just shots practicing um, more from under the net or from when you're late. Because a lot of times um, in a match when you feel nervous or um, you, you start to feel tight and a little tense with, with a lot of pressure, some of the hardest shots for you to hit are shots when you're late or when you're under the, under the net because that's where the most amount of pressure is. If you hit something a little bit, a little bit bad or a, a poor quality shot, either it's in the net or outside of the court, or your opponent is gonna kill the next, the next shot. So I like to get those kind of into the routine so you get a little comfortable and you can relax. And then the next set of uh, exercises here is to, to kind of concentrate on the uh, smash and net game. When you're in the front court, again, if you're tense, you know, it's really hard to play your finesse shots. And um, this is an opportunity to just get the player comfortable playing the net, relaxing. And then after they play the net, the person feeding them can lift and they can practice a smash. And in that smash, what we're trying to get the players to do is, you know, get rid of the, the tension in their body, become a little aggressive, and then, um, you know, getting, getting into that, that attacking mindset. And then the last is just a pattern, attacking pattern drill. Um, and that's just really to get the player up to full power and speed for what they're going to experience in, in the real match. So it, it's step by step, it gets the player comfortable, it gets them relaxed, and then you're building up the power and speed for to simulate what they're going to experience in the real game. So here's a few videos. Uh, we'll start first with the recovery shots so you can get an idea. If they're a singles player, they would follow exactly like this video and it can be done um, one versus one in a half court setting or it could be one versus two in a full court. If you're a doubles player, usually we'll do these types of um, exercises just focusing from the mid court to the back court. <clears throat> but as you can see in this video, the players, you know, catching all of the shuttles late, they're basically just hitting recovery shots back into the court, trying to get comfortable with those finesse shots and, you know, how to get out of trouble because it, it, it's almost impossible to play a rally where, you know, your opponent's not hitting a good shot and you need to recover from. So this is a really good, useful drill to get um, your players comfortable. <clears throat> the second hitting routine here is to play a lot of net strokes. You can see um, that he plays a few net strokes and then the, the feeders will give him a lift to smash. So this way he's able to play his finesse game in the front, be a little creative with his net play. And then he, he's starting to practice getting up to full speed and pouncing on the shuttle. So these are just really um, short exercises to get rid of those nerves and get that player comfortable 
get them caught up to speed uh, for what they're going to experience in the match. It's been really useful um, for myself and, you know, I've had the opportunity and um, the blessing to coach lots of great players. And this is just one of the tools that um, kind of helps them get ready and prepared for, for the match ahead. <clears throat> Next, I want to concentrate a little bit on uh, managing your emotions. Within a match, um, you're going to experience lots of uh, changes. Um, you'll have to make adjustments in your strategy. There may be times where everything seems to be working, and there may be times where nothing seems to be working. And it's really important here to control your emotions, make sure we don't get too high or too low. And here's just a few um, pointers that you can take on court with you that will help channel the positive emotions and help block out some of those negative ones. As you can see here in the picture below, <clears throat> in, the, in the bottom right corner, we have one player here who just won the point. You can see her, her body language is positive. She's pumping her fist. Um, you, you can see the positivity in her, in her emotion there. Whereas the, the other opponent, she, she just lost a point. She seems a little rejected. We're not saying that um, she's frustrated or she could be tired at this point, but from the body language, you can see, you could see who's winning at this moment of the match. So <clears throat> if you see usually in this cycle here, when you have a positive attitude, you're enjoying your time on court. You're, you're having fun. You feel relaxed during the rallies. Yeah, and that translates into confidence and creativity and how you're hitting the strokes, right? You're not stuck in this um, serious pattern where you're tensed and you're worried and the strategy that you're given, you're only focusing on those, you know, one or two, three points and you just keep forcing that issue on the opponent. And when, and when, that, when that doesn't work, it tends to lead to frustration. And usually this just ends up becoming a cycle. After you get frustrated, you don't know what to do. You go back and you keep trying to do the same things and it just you just keep going down this funnel and this path and it's really hard to get out. So it's just important to make sure that you keep this relaxed and fun environment. But you also, you have to have a balance here because you know certain players when, when, they're, when they're enjoying it too much and they relax too much, they may have lost control of the match. They may have given the opponent a chance to, to gain momentum. And it's really about balancing between the two here. Make sure there's a little bit of serious, there's a little bit of fun. And when you, when you sense a little like um, carelessness, you may be having too much fun. And when you start to sense a little frustration, you may need to open that creative side again so that you can kind of balance your emotions there. And then a few things that you can do, you know, during the course of the matches, make sure when you score that you're celebrating yourself. That doesn't mean that you're pumping your chest and you know cheering on with the crowd. It still needs to be in, in great sportsmanship and a professional manner, but you don't want to get to the point where you're only showing emotion when you're losing points. And when you're winning points, you just go back and serve again. You want to make sure that you know, you're, you're emphasizing the points that you won. And when your opponent scores, you're not getting down on yourself. You know, a, a, a useful tool that when your opponent is scoring, I like to tell my players, hey, let's focus on the strategy. Use those affirmations that you made when you came into the tournament. I have a good serve. Get, you have to use that opportunity to switch your mind and focus again on you know, small little things here rather than, oh, I just lost a point in or my opponent is winning now and I don't know how to catch up. You don't want to get caught into, um, into that um, downward spiral, spiral, I would say. And then practice self-talk. Um, <clears throat> a lot of players may not feel comfortable talking to themselves on the court, but it's really important that um, you start to hear, hear yourself speak um, your affirmations or the strategy from the coach. And <clears throat> the reason why that is, is this is why we have the players do the exercise in the beginning where they have to um, you know, list what things they're good at or what type of feelings they want to feel. Once the player understands their own thoughts and feelings on the court, 
the advantage they have from here is they can also start to understand the thoughts and feelings of their opponent. And without practicing self-talk, that's very difficult to do. So it's a, it's a huge advantage to understand when your opponent is feeling nervous or when they are feeling safe or when they're feeling confident. It's you have this advantage to know what they're feeling and what you think they're going to do. And by practicing that on yourself, it also gives you the power to understand that from, from your opponent. And the last is obviously the most important is just enjoy your time on the court. You know, you've earned this opportunity to be in this big match, to be on this big stage. You deserve to be there. It's a chance to improve and get better. And winning and losing is out of your control. So enjoy that experience. You know, this is a, this is a, a test for all the hard work that you've put in. And it needs to be looked at in a more positive way rather than um, you know, having that fear for losing. <clears throat> and then on the court, it's important to, to play these like mini mind games with yourself. Scoring 21 points, is, it's, it's so challenging. There's so many different things that's going to happen within one set of 21 points. There's going to be different strategies happening. Your opponent's going to go on a run. You may, you may not be playing well at a certain point in the game. And if you can break the, the long game of 21 points into small mini games, it can help you keep, like, keep your mind focused on the task at hand, and it can block out that pressure and that negativity because you're just focused on little small tasks. So you can play this game with yourself like, oh, I want to be the first to 11 points. So now you're not really, you're not caring about if you're winning or losing. Your goal here is how do I get to the interval first? What do I I need to do? Do I need to be aggressive? What, you know, how do I get in that mindset? So the players already taken their mind off of winning and losing. Now they're focused on, you know, how do I get to the first interval with a lead? Second is scoring on your serve. Um, this is super important with a, with a 21 point rally scoring system. If you can't score on your serve, you're not building a lead. You're basically just trading points with your opponent. So now you're getting without the player even noticing, focusing on scoring on their serve, they're already concentrating on how do I build a lead? How do I bridge a gap between, you know, my score and my opponent? Or something as simple as every rally must pass five shots. What that does for a player is I'm not giving away free points to my opponent. Everything must be earned. They have to move the shuttle around the court. They're not going to get an easy opportunity to score early in the rally. So Having these little mind games with yourself will, you know, distract you from, you know, the overall result of winning and losing, and it'll keep you kind of more focused on the task at hand. And you have to be ready to make adjustments. A lot of times, um, as a coach and a player, um, sometimes we have came up with a strategy that we want to use for this game or against this opponent, and we feel that's the way that um, we're going to win. But it doesn't always work that way. It could be the shuttles, you know, it, it's, it's slow, it's fast. It could be our opponent today is, is playing far, far much better than what we expected. And you have to be prepared to change that strategy, or you might have to even throw that strategy out entirely and start to build a new one. But um, <clears throat> what I see in a lot of younger players is it's really tough for them to, you know, calm their emotions and take a step back and say, okay, I need to be more creative here and find additional ways that, um, you know, I can overcome these obstacles and, you know, come up with a, a game plan to, to beat my opponent. So those are kind of some of the mind games that I, I do with myself as a coach. And also I will entertain those with my players as well. Um, so that, you know, the task doesn't seem so astronomical. It can, we can make it a lot more simpler for them to, to just concentrate and uh, enjoy and execute. <clears throat> and now the most important is how can we take that pressure off of ourselves and reflect that onto our opponent? There's a few methods here um, that will really help you do that. And again, this goes back to the more you understand yourself as a player, how you think, how you feel, the more you can also anticipate what your opponent is thinking and feeling. And the first way to um, remove that pressure from yourself while you're in a match it sounds simple, but it's not that easy to do. It's, it's just moving to the shuttle first versus letting the shuttle come to you. 
a lot of players are very skillful, so they like to let the shuttle come to them and they can use their racket techniques to move around the shuttle. But when you do that, you're also assuming a lot of the pressure that you have to hit this really nice stroke or this really nice quality of a shot so that your opponent can attack you. And a lot of times that puts a lot of pressure on your technique. And when you're already nervous, it's in your tense, it's really hard to do that. Simply by initiating and moving to the shuttle first rather than letting it come to you, will, it will put that pressure on your opponent. So I'll give you an, an example of that. If someone was to come to me aggressively and walk to me very closely, my initial reaction would be to stop. I would hesitate, I would pause, I may step back and retreat, right? So I'm already into a defensive mindset just because this person is moving towards me. And that's what moving the shuttle could do for you. It could take that pressure off of yourself and push that onto your opponent. And that, that's huge. That's just by a simple, you know, moving to the shuttle versus letting it come to you, right? Another is disguising your shot. Use your body language to help enhance, you know, what you're trying to do. You don't have to always rely on your racket skills alone, right? If you think about if you're in a, in a low crouching posture, you look like you're going to pounce on the shuttle. You look like you're going to attack, attack the bird. And in that body language, again, you're showing an aggressive nature. And what that does to your opponent, it tends to, you know, make them pause, make them hesitate, make them stop first to see what you're going to do. And if your opponent has to stop to see what you're going to do first, they're either going to just maintain the rally with you or they're going to fall behind in the rally. And that's just a way, you know, when you're ahead in the rally, your opponent's going to feel the pressure to keep up because you're dictating what's going on within the game. The second here is your, your racket technique, <clears throat> holding a flat racket face to hide your shot, using certain fakes when uh, you're playing on the court, uh, skills like uh, uh, slice drops or net spins. These are all kind of um, you know, advanced techniques where not only does it make your shot more um, deadly, but it also hides the initial stroke that you're gonna hit from your opponent. And you know, when you do those things, Again, your opponent's either you know, following your pace in the rally or they're falling behind and giving you additional opportunities to attack. And then variety, just making those adjustments, making sure that whatever shots you're playing on the court that you keep changing your patterns, not that when your opponent hits to a certain corner, you are tending to hit these one or two shots because if your opponent can read those patterns, now they're ahead of you in the rally, they're starting to dictate what's happening. They're controlling the pace and the speed of the play. And that's where you're going to feel more pressure. So if you can constantly change, you know, your patterns, your opponent's not able to read what you're doing. And then that takes a lot of pressure off you, you know, mentally and physically. Um, the second is not allowing uh, your opponent to score easily here. <clears throat> we go back to, you know, not making mistakes in the first five shots focusing on corners that you know your opponent's not so strong in if you're able to identify those areas in the court where your opponent's not really looking to score points you're putting them in an uncomfortable position because now they have to continue the rally and as the rally continues on and on as it's human nature to get a bit frustrated and and wonder how come i'm not getting any opportunities to score and from there, you know, they start to feel more pressure. They take more risk and uncalculated risk. And you, you start to create these unforced errors. And when you start scoring points easily, you know, that builds your confidence. That builds your momentum. And in return, you know, your opponent is feeling the exact opposite. You know, they're, they're wondering why everything is going your way versus where, you know, everything is a struggle for them. So that's, an, that's kind of an easy way to, you know, put that pressure and um, you know, reflect that onto your opponent. And then just touching a little more on when you understand your own emotions, your thoughts and your feelings, you can understand also what your opponent likes and dislikes when they're on the court. You have to read their body language after a rally finishes. A lot of players, when they win a point, they don't look at you know, the reaction from their opponent because you can learn a lot from their body language. You can learn, are they tired? Are they injured? 
Did you hit it to a spot where they're very frustrated? You, it's, it's really important to, um, to be able to read that because in the next rally, you, could, you can predict what your opponent will do. Like if you see an opponent very frustrated at the end of a rally, on the next rally, they may come out and you know they have this aggressive nature. So you know they're gonna wanna attack. So if you change your mindset and say, hey, I wanna keep the shuttle down and I don't wanna give an opportunity to attack, you know that your opponent's already frustrated. They're gonna be rushing. So you know kind of what to expect, right? So there's a lot of tells that you can get um, from reading your, your opponent's body language. And when, when you get them in that uncomfortable position, your opponent tends to take less risk. They stop anticipating and they, they start, to be honest, they start playing safer. They become predictable. And at that point, that, that's, that's where you're able to take those risks, those calculated risks and you know, anticipate and jump on you know, certain patterns that they have. Because when we're all a little nervous and safe, you know, we, we have very predictable patterns. And, and that's kind of some of these very useful tools that you can use in the match, right? To take that pressure off of yourself and put it onto your opponent. So those are very successful. And the last here that I'll touch uh, within the tournament is kind of your recovery. <clears throat> After each match, you know, you're, you're spending a lot, expending a lot of energy, you know, you've pushed your body to the limits and it's important how you recover from match to match. <clears throat> the first that um, I like the players to do is when they cool down after a match is to have three minutes of, you know, a deep breathing where they're off to the, off to the side by themselves, let them slow down their rate, their heart rate, let them calm their emotions, just really take in the moment and kind of process what's, what just happened. How did the match go? Let them digest before, you know, you really go back to them and critique what's going on <clears throat> from that session. The player should, you know, go into a deep stretch, 10 to 15 minutes, feel your body out, feel where there's, you know, any aches and pains or muscle tightness or stiffness. Um, you really want to address those areas so that, you know, it doesn't lead to a, a more severe injury or, you know, tomorrow when, when you're trying to warm up for, for another match that, you know, your body still feels tight from, from the previous one. It's really important to address those right away. If there's any um, kind of food or sports drinks that you know they can have at that moment too to replenish their in, uh, their energy, that's also a key right after a match. And then any type of um, physical therapy that can be done, whether um, icing, heating, um, any kind of massage or work with um, a foam roller, those are all really nice ways to kind of loosen up the muscles, help them recover faster, get rid of that lactic acid. <clears throat> So the, those are some key areas that um, the players can use to recover after a match. And then from here, I, I think it goes to where the athletes have to work really closely with their coach and vice versa. It's the match has, the match has finished. Let's take two to three things that, that you did well. Let's concentrate on those. Let's acknowledge those that, you know, this was done well. And, and let's pick a few things that we can make adjustments to move forward in the next game. It could be um, game strategy, or it could just be, you know, some, some of the tools as like, you weren't moving to the shuttle. You were very tense and tight when you were playing. How can we get you to relax? You know, th there's a, <clears throat> it's just a quick review so that the player doesn't go from one match to the next match and not really address anything. And then they run into the same set of problems in the second match. And a lot of times that happens, whether you know, the way the tournament is set up, you don't have a lot of time in between matches or um, you felt very tired or your body was injured and there was other, you know, therapy sessions that took up that time. But it's really important to reflect on the game so that you understand what you did well and, you know, certain areas where you can do better. <clears throat> and then take that time to review any film you have on your, on your next opponent. You don't want to go into a match um, with no strategy or game plan. I mean, that goes back to how we started um, the presentation, you know, having a goal, having a strategy, a game plan in place gives you a purpose, gives you a plan. Um, when you have, when you have an expectation of certain, the way certain things will go, you also feel comfortable. And when you feel comfortable, you also feel confident. And that's very important 
stepping into a match is that you feel you feel that routine, you feel confident, you 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 kind of know what's going to happen. That will help you, um, you know, get your mind in the right space. So I know that's a lot of information to cover um, um, <clears throat> in the pre-tournament and the uh, in-tournament exercises. And I'll hand this back off to the Pan Am team for us to take a take a short break. Thank you, Richard. Sure. <clears throat> the last uh, section of the presentation I want to concentrate on is now we take those lessons learned from your pre-tournament and your in-tournament, and you know we want to apply those into um, our post-tournament exercise. We want to reflect on that. We want to build that into our training plan, and you know we want to have these these check points along the way to ensure that we're, we're making progress, we're on the right track, you know, before our next, our next competition. <clears throat> so a lot like our first exercise in the pre-tournament and the post-tournament, it's really important to, you know, reflect on what, what did you do well? Certain, certain instances, like uh, I kept my composure well when I was losing points. Um, I played, I played with confidence. I had a great feeling in my shots. I could see and read what my opponent was doing, even as simple as I believed in myself. Cause a lot of times as a player, you know, you're in the, in a different environment under pressure, you may be playing a really high level person and you may not have that confidence in yourself. And I think having the player acknowledge what they did well is really, really important because as it's human nature to, you know, we might dwell on what we didn't do well. And I think it's really important to have the players acknowledge that from within. And then let's, let's have them talk about, you know, some of the uncomfortable areas, like where did you feel less confident? What was your opponent doing that made you feel nervous or made you feel uncomfortable? Like uh, my opponent was able to attack my backhand, my physical conditioning, could have been better, or I was not able to score on my serve. I had a hard time killing my opponent. <clears throat> we have them list these out so we can understand, you know, what areas did they feel um, put them in a, in not great circumstances in the rallies. And, and as a coach, the advantage of this is we take from what, what all the players did in the tournament and we can develop a training program around that. But this is a really specific um, exercise that you can do with each athlete. And then the athletes can develop their own program. You can choose like two to three items from the less confident list. And the players can develop their own program um, to work on these outside of training. <clears throat> so I took two things from this list. For example, uh, one was I wasn't able to score on my serve. And the other was I had a hard time killing my opponent. <laughs> Funny thing is, uh, these are two things that I struggled with as a player. Um, naturally, just because I was a more defensive and counter style of player, I was not a very aggressive person. So it, it's pretty easy for, for me here to kind of design a program. <clears throat> and these sessions shouldn't be too long because you have your usual group training sessions and we don't want to get the, the athlete tired. But it should be about two to three sessions a week and, and one hour of each session where they can work on examples like this. If I wanted to, if I had a hard time killing my opponent, here are some exercises that I would do. I would work on my slice drop shots from the back court. I want to improve the quality of the shot, the accuracy, right? So I, I may use that one hour to just hit standing slice drops and just work on that quality. Or maybe, you know, my smash was outside of the court or in the net. So <clears throat> I would use that chance to use that hour to smash and knock down specific targets so that, you know, my accuracy was on point. I could get the speed and my smash or the power as well. Or you can even make it a lot more advanced if you had more energy and you wanted to push yourself to work on uh, different attacking combinations in a multi-shuttle format. Or if you wanted to do that on a one-on-one -on -one drill, like attack defense in, in, or uh, to 21 points, you can use these kind of drills here below <clears throat> and you can work on both aspects so for example if I was on attack and I was working with a teammate of mine who was defending my offense you know I will stay on offense and I will have to serve at the beginning of every rally so subconsciously you're training yourself or you're training your player that 
hey, every rally, I'm starting with my serve first. So I'm getting more repetition in my serve and I'm practicing. When I serve, I'm gonna be aggressive. I'm trying to score. I'm trying to kill my opponent. And as the player gets to practice this repetition over and over on those extra one hour sessions, you're gonna go into the next tournament knowing that you've spent X amount of hours working on an area that you felt uncomfortable previously on an area that your opponent picked on before. And that is no longer a weakness or it's not as strong of a weakness that you have moving in to the next tournament. And when you take that kind of action, it builds the player's confidence because you have addressed something that has brought them that tension or that nervousness. You've taken away a weakness and you're kind of turning it into a strength. And now the player understands how to react if that situation happened again. Let's say you came into a tournament or a match and you're facing the same issue. I'm having a hard time killing my opponent. Okay, let's reflect. What did you work on in your exercises? Oh, I worked on my slice drops. I know that the quality has gone well. Okay, I'm going to be using that weapon more because I've been practicing that. Or I've been smashing these shots down the line to knock down targets. Now I know my straight smash is very accurate. It's on point. Oh, when I'm having a tough time killing my opponent, I'm going to go to that skill. So now you have a plan of attack versus... Oh, the last tournament, I got caught in this scenario where I couldn't kill my opponent and I got stuck. I didn't know what to do, but they've been working on this and they have a, an extra tool in their back to overcome these obstacles. And that's really the benefit of playing tournaments is not only do you want to win, but you're also improving and you're also finding areas that you can improve your game. So it's really important in any competition to really give your best and not that's not only for the sportsmanship of the game but it's also to give you the data and the information on what you can improve on or give that the, the coach also gets that information if you're in a match and you got frustrated and you gave up you're really not learning anything and the coach and yourself is not gaining any knowledge for how can we make you better when this the second time comes around. So it's really important to really push, give it your all, no matter the circumstances, and at least you'll be able to find different areas on where you can improve your, your game. And then the last is, how do you measure your progress? Like you've been working on these um, exercises and activities, but you need to monitor is if you're actually improving at it, is it gonna work? Are you gonna be able to apply it to the next tournament? You don't wanna be working on something for the whole six to eight weeks. And then you come into the tournament and realize, oh my God, it hasn't gotten better. Or I shouldn't have been working on that. I thought that was a really important key point in my, in my game, but it's not. I should have been addressing these issues. So you wanna have these checkpoints in your training. <clears throat> and a few ways you can do that is re record yourself playing a full match. So if I'm focusing on, um, I wanted to be able to kill my opponent, I'm going to review my winners versus my unforced errors ratio. So maybe I will record a match and practice once a week or once every other week. And I'll sit down and I'll review those and I'll see, okay, this week I had 10 winners with 12 unforced errors. So it's, it's a little bit less than 50-50. And then the next time that I record myself, oh, now I have 12 winners and I have eight unforced errors you can see that you know, your accuracy is improving and you're attacking shots and you're on the right track and you can keep going. Or you, you can record how many points you won on your serve versus uh, your opponent. Now you can start to measure, okay, what's, what's wrong with my serve? Am I, if, am I not being aggressive enough? Is the quality of my serve not good enough? Maybe I need to take a step back and work on the quality of my serve or does there need to be serving to different point so my opponent doesn't put so much pressure on me. <clears throat> it's a very useful tool to kind of measure the progress of what you're working on. And then as you go through week after week, we need to increase the level of di difficulty in those training sessions that you're trying to improve these areas. Because you're going to start in uh, maybe in a very um, stationary position practicing these strokes but that's so different from what you're gonna experience in the middle of a match. You may need to add speed. You may need to be jumping. You may need to uh, make um, less errors when doing 
that, right? Or you may need to give yourself a target that you have to hit so you're able to execute these shots under pressure. So there's a lot of different areas here now that you have to increase that level of difficulty. You have to start simulating what you're gonna feel in the tournament and create that environment and training so that when you step into the tournament, it's almost the same. I mean, it, it, may, ne it may never match the intensity of a real uh, tournament, but you could at least get it close so that you would feel comfortable in that environment. And then the alas is like, if you're work working on your offense here, you know, just judging yourself and seeing like, hey, am I able to score in, in shorter rallies than before? Like, usually it took me 10 shots before I can get an offensive opportunity. Now, after my serve return and my second shot, I'm able to create something good to score a point. Or um, you can monitor how many chances you've had to smash in a whole game. The first recorded match that you watched, you only, ha you only had 10 whole smashes in, th in the set. And you know that has to increase if you want to be able to kill your opponent. Because the more chances you take in training to, to attack, the better your attack is going to get over time. So th those are just some ways that you can set up checkpoints to make sure you're working on the right things and that they're progressing so that the next time that you step, you know, into, into the tournament and into the match that you, you'll be confident, you'll be prepared to, to perform. So with that said, I hope that, uh, you know, that's a lot of information. Um, I know that this, these slides and this presentation will be available on YouTube for you to review later. But I hope that you know some of the experience that I've had as a coach and a player can benefit you, whether you're, you're a player yourself, you're a parent, or you're a coach. These are all kind of very useful, very mindful methods that um, can help you, you know, get rid of those nerves and that pressure and get you to play to the best of your ability. So thank you again to Badminton Pan Am for the opportunity to be a part of the Coach's Corner. And I, I hope you guys enjoyed the presentation today. Thank you very much, Raj. We will now move on to the question and answer section, but we're actually running a little bit long time. So I'm just gonna ask you one quick question. Um, sure. Janish had posted a question before, and I think a little bit lo got lost in the translation, but I think what he's asking is transitioning from a young player to major events, how can you manage pressure and emotions? Transitioning from a young player to a professional player? Yeah. I think here it's um, it's really important how we build the young player's mindset and confidence. I think a lot of times um, they want to move very fast along the cycle to win, and they may have a lot of talent, and the coaches may put a lot of ex ex expectations or pressure on the player themselves. I think it's really important to guide the player and let them hear let them talk about you know, what they want to achieve. And then the coach can break that down in a step-by-step -step process. Kind of like um, one of my early slides where you know, it says, I wanna win a second round match or I wanna beat a seated player. Now I wanna get to the semifinals and win a medal. Like a coach can design kind of that outline program for the player so that as they overcome each hurdle, they're building that confidence versus like they're going into these big competitions and they're losing early. They're getting, you know, dejected. They they lost their spirit, their motivation to work hard. They realize, oh my God, it's way harder than I thought. I think it's really important how we, um, you know, design that process for them so they're getting a positive and healthy experience along the way. Okay, thank you very much again, Raj, for your interesting lecture, and to our audience. Please help us improve the quality of our con um, content of our program by completing anonymously the question that will appear on your screen. We also encourage you to write to us through the chat box and make proposals of topics you are interested in. Also, we invite you to check out Badminton Pan America Chan Confederation YouTube channel where you can see this and other conferences that we have held. It is time to connect with Pan American office in Lima, Peru. Please, Herman, it's your turn. Good afternoon, Gregory. Good afternoon, Rayu. Thanks for a very interesting and educational presentation.
I really enjoyed being here as, as always, and also in this step-by-step -step preparation for the players. Appreciate this. Thank no? you. And then uh, Gregory, Jorge, please, if we can begin. Uh, this is, as you may all know, this is our last uh, presentation of the season. This is a season closing. So I want to make some, some points about this season. No? In this season, which began in March and we are finalizing by the end of May, we have done 13 presentations. 13 presentations, we have been good in the following on these uh, different topics. We had para badminton, we have some research, we have uh, our, our lady coaches presenting and, mm -hmm. and sharing the experience of, of working and moving ahead with their coach education. Next, Jorge, please. Then uh, we have uh, attendees, countries attending from Pan America. We have 27 countries from Europe, six countries, Africa, nine countries, Asia, four countries, one country from Oceania. This means 47 countries and coming out from the five continents around the world, which is very important. And we are happy that we are contributing to, for this uh, information on badminton. Jorge, next, please. Then, uh, I, I would like to share our audience and the gender that we have, the audience on the session we have this so far, not including today, no, but uh, we have a very good average on presentations on, on gender attendance, no, male and female, which is very good for us and for everyone. So our lady coaches are taking part, our men coaches are taking part of those. So everybody's interested on this. Next, please, Jorge. Then uh, we will have, I would like to especially thank the, the, the coaches that have been with us all this season. Chile, Chile from Guatemala. Chile is a lady coach who trains in San Marcos uh, department in Guatemala. My friend Julio Correa from Puerto Rico, one of the first uh, tutors on shuttle time and still working on badminton in Puerto Rico. Julio, un abrazo, gracias por estar con nosotros. And then we have Gabriela Melgoza from Mexico, from Senegal, Lija Lima, Lija Lima. Then from Bolivia, El Salvador, Costa Rica, no? And uh, that uh, tell us how we are reaching around the, the, the different countries. The most, the highest participation, we have Mexico, Peru, Guatemala, and Brazil following us through different uh, presentations. Jorge, please. There, there we can have an average of 24 countries and four continents per presentation. So with the reach we have is important. Yes, Jorge, please. Then uh, if we go to Zoom and YouTube on this season, we have the average views. We are having around 200, close to 250 views attendance either by Zoom or YouTube, which is very important if we consider it's almost a year, as Mr. President told, him, told us before, it's almost a year of this presentation. It's an average of one per week, and we are having 250 percent uh, attendance during these presentations. Thank you, Jorge, please, next. Then uh, the most watched videos, the number one is, was Air Badminton, that's in season one. I'm happy to say that in next season, in season four, we will have Rodrigo Pacheco from Badminton World Federation office presenting again uh, Air Badminton, another topic, another item. Then our first um, research presentation we did about the jumps match, which opened for every coach a new perspective on investigation, on following these uh, researches that we have already by Badminton World Federation. And then also to mention the first, the first presentation we had last year with Arturo Riz from Spain about the crisis and opportunity on badminton. This was a presentation we did uh, at the beginning of the crisis in which we were not knowing exactly how this, we would work on this pandemic, no? Fortunately, we are moving ahead and, and different countries in different stages, but this was our first presentation. It's among the top three we had, no? Next please, Jorge. Then uh, you can see in YouTube channel, all the presentation for this season in three languages. I think that's very important for our following. We have uh, English, Spanish, and French simultaneous translation while we do the presentation and also in YouTube. 
So it's not only that if you are present, you have this presentation, but if you go into YouTube, you will see, for example, Rajus today presentation in English, Spanish, and French. So that's also very helpful. That's why our rich coverage around the world is, is very important for us, and not only in the region. This next, Jorge. Well, that's uh, what I can tell you at this moment. Very happy to have you here to be part of us and uh, waiting for you on the fifth season that we'll have coming July. Uh, thanks to all the presenters, Adrian, Richard, Raju, in, in your person to all the presenters we had this season. I hope to have you again. I see the, on, the, on the chat that some coaches are trying to reach you after the, the presentation, so that's important. Some coach from Madagascar, I think, was, was also looking on you. So that's very important, the reach that we have and the assistance that we can give around the world and not, not only to our region. Thanks for being there with us, for us, and thanks to everyone. Muchas gracias a todos. See you in some weeks' time. Thank you. Thanks to all. Gregory. Thank you, Herman. On behalf of Badminton Pan America Confederation, we thank you for your participation. Stay well, stay safe, and see you in the next season.